hear I'm able to say that, I don't believe it. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm just not tuned into it. I mean, it could be. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I can't say that it's not there. You know, what am I to say? Uh, there are, there are times that he says that you know I just don't have the experience. Although he won't, he won't say he believes in ghosts. He won't be in here alone either. I just don't, you know, I just don't connect with it, and don't, and don't believe in it, and and people are disappointed when when they approach me with it and I say that because they would rather hear a ghost story than to hear me say I don't believe it. I think he has. He, he'll deny it to the end, but my opinion, he has to. Everybody who comes here or stays any amount of time has experience. There's, there's no way he hasn't. We come here anywhere from two to four times a week, and I don't think there's been a single time where we've come here and not gotten something. Uh, I think he's afraid it might hurt his business. So you think he has been affected? I don't want to answer a question and get in trouble, that's the thing. I think he said he hasn't even been in the basement for 25 years. I'm not tuned into it. It's not something that I'm going to dwell on. Tucked away in the small town of Wilder, Kentucky, built just off the Licking River at 44 Licking Pike, sits a local bar that has a deeply rooted history of love, hate, betrayal, and even murder. They say the past is just that, but in the case of what is now Bobby Mackey's music world, that's not quite accurate. To get to the story of Bobby Mackey and his connection with this building, you have to first understand the long, dark history behind this unsettling piece of land. The ground where the local country music bar now stands has stories that date back to the mid-1800s when it was the largest meatpacking house around. The butchers would work on animals in what is now the basement of the former slaughterhouse. Gallons of blood from the animals would empty down into a man-made well that spilled right out into the northern flowing waters of the Licking River. The meatpacking business closed its doors sometime in the early 1890s. The writings of author Doug Hensley claim that this location was once used as a spot for occultists. There's no hard evidence to support these claims, however. It could have just been an author's artistic license to support his own theories or sell books. The site was catapulted into legend after one of the most mysterious murders in northern Kentucky barreled its way into the eye of the media in 1896. The attention-grabbing murder of a pregnant 22-year-old Greencastle, Indiana girl by the name of Pearl Bryan changed everything. There are few sides as to what really occurred that night, and to this day those details are still clouded in mystery. But as the story goes, a 28-year-old man from Maine named Scott Jackson was introduced to the young Pearl Bryan through her second cousin, DePaul student Will Wood, in 1893. Scott Jackson won the heart of Miss Bryan during his on and off visits to see his close friend, Mr. Wood. In September of 1895, they became intimate. Scott was studying at the private Ohio College of Dental Surgery in Cincinnati. Jackson became tired of Pearl, and in October he had to return to Cincinnati to continue his studies. Pearl informed Woods of her pregnancy, to which he wasted no time relaying the message back to Scott Jackson through a series of letters. Jackson later stated during his interrogation that Will Wood was in fact the father of Pearl's child, and he was merely trying to help his friend cover up the family disgrace. Will Wood would deny this allegation when questioned by authorities. Another letter indicated Jackson was in fact responsible and tried many drugs through mail to reverse the pregnancy, but they failed. Jackson figured he would rectify the situation with an impromptu abortion. Pearl traveled to Cincinnati via train in January of 1896 in the hopes of either seeing this procedure through or to convince Jackson to be a father. Pearl left her parents' farmhouse in Greencastle five months pregnant, telling them she was headed to Indianapolis. She'd actually made plans to meet up with Jackson. Scott brought his reacquainted roommate Alonzo Walling, a 20-year-old native of Mount Carmel and friend from their former days at the Indianapolis Dental College. Later, Jackson would claim that the abortion was all Alonzo Walling's idea. They'd only known each other for about a year. 
January 30th, Alonzo, Scott, and Pearl began walking around the Cincinnati area until they reached Fourth and Elm, where they began a very public argument about either why the abortion had yet to occur or that she didn't want it to begin with. The following night, the three of them would go to Wallingford Saloon at Fourth and Plum, where it is said that Jackson proceeded to slip a concoction of arsenic and cocaine into Pearl sarsaparilla. The concoction of chemicals were also meant to help aid in the silencing of her voice. Their poor judgment led them to believe that crossing over the Ohio River into Kentucky, using the central bridge just near Fort Thomas, would be the best course of action once the lady fell ill. They slashed her neck while she was still alive. Apparently, Pearl put up a fight for her life to no avail. She had cuts to her hands where she was grabbing for the knife. Her clothes were torn and scattered all over the crime scene. Coincidentally, Alonzo had fresh scratches on his arms. The body was then dragged and flipped the Alexandria Turnpike, two miles from the slaughterhouse. Alexandria Turnpike, two miles from the slaughterhouse. The victim's head was nowhere to be found. A 16-year-old kid by the name of John Hewing was cutting across the field of his boss, Colonel John Locke, when he spotted the body. Supposedly, it was 200 feet off the Alexandria Turnpike around Grandview Avenue in what was once Colonel Locke's farmland, now a residential area. As the story's been told in literature, the coachman stopped just short of Grandview Avenue and let them off. The rest will never truly be known. This is the spot where Miss Bryan and her unborn child met their brutal end. Hewing stated in his own words, I didn't know if she was just drunk or dead, that a lot of women came out here with soldiers. Pearl's body was later identified by the manufacturer's number in one of her shoes. The shoes were tracked back to Greencastle shoemaker Lewis and Hayes, who did verify she had indeed purchased them there. Four days after the body was found, so were the numerous letters Wood had written to Scott Jackson. Detective Cal Krim was restless on pursuing Jackson. The trail led straight to all three men. Jackson's blood-soaked coat was eventually found in a sewer drain nearby. It was even reported that Jackson kept a lock of the girl's hair. Jackson asked if Walling had been arrested yet. At the time, nobody even knew of Walling's involvement. He began to accuse Alonzo Walling of the actual murder. More and more of the truth spilled out. Both men went back and forth, pointing the finger at each other. On February 13th, both men were indicted on murder charges. Will Wood was soon let go when he testified against both. The police and Pearl's family only cared about recovering Pearl's head at this point. Neither man, however, would confess to what they did with the head. Jackson said that Walling cut up the skull and threw it into the Ohio River. Walling believed that Jackson had buried it in the neighborhood or thrown it in a sewer or tossed it over into the river. The police did think to look in the well at the slaughterhouse, but didn't find anything. Jackson did leave a bloody valise with a woman's belongings with a barkeeper friend at Legner's Saloon. The next day, Jackson returned to claim it. Police later confronted him about this. The valise now rests in the Campbell County Historical Museum. Legend has it, aided by Doug Hensley's book, that both Jackson and Walling were members of the occult and used Pearl's head as a sacrifice to the devil at the slaughterhouse, using the well of blood to dispose of it as it drained out and into the river. Another myth is that the head was burned in a furnace in the basement at the medical school. There's no real evidence that ties Pearl to here. Um, it's a good story and it, you know, there, there's a possibility that she could have her head thrown in that well. There was a, a, a skull found near the crime scene, which was never forensically proven to be Pearl Bryan's, but how many heads are floating around the field. Um, you know, so it's possible her head was thrown in the well, it's possible it was there, it's possible it was incinerated, uh, that's one theory. Um, but people see her ghost here and claim to see her ghost often. Neither Jackson nor Walling had any remorse for Pearl's family during their trials even when begged to reveal the location of the poor girl's missing part. The head was never found. Pearl would be laid to rest without it in Greencastle, Indiana. Today, her grave rests at Forest Hill Cemetery with no real tombstone to identify it due to vandalism over the last 114 years. It's not too hard to find, though. People place pennies on the block that is there, heads up, in hopes that it will help her in the afterlife. 
Jackson and Walling were sentenced to hang at the gallows just behind the courthouse in Newport on March 21, 1897. It would be the last official public hanging in Campbell County. Jackson stated that Walling was innocent, giving Walling a sliver of relief. However, when pressed for more information, Jackson stopped talking. When Jackson was asked if he had anything further to say, he concluded that he was innocent. God would see the truth. He went on to finish with his vow to return in the afterlife and haunt the area forever. Both men fell at 11.40 a.m. They didn't die from strangulation until four minutes later. They suffered through a violently agonizing and botched hanging. Not long after the trial and public execution of Jackson and Walling, the slaughterhouse was mostly torn down. There were numerous murders in and around the building, with the bodies being dumped out back into the Licking River. The mob had turned the place into an illegal liquor operation, running booze up through the well, and nothing was going to ruin that business. Prohibition fueled the owner's pockets until the 21st Amendment in 1933. It can never truly be known what occurred behind closed doors during all that time. The stories of the mob days are a lot more real. They did a lot of tortures and killings here, and that's um, definitely where a lot of the haunted activity comes from is the mob days. There's a tavern and casino, the Primrose, as it was called at the time, enjoyed huge financial success until the mob in Cincinnati took notice. The Campbell County Police would use sledgehammers to bust into the club and confiscate gambling equipment. Eventually, the owner at the time, E.A. Brady, sold the property to the mob and would later commit suicide. During the 1950s, the bar was reopened as a nightclub called the Latin Quarter. The owner of the newest business in this building had a cabaret dancer in his employ, his daughter, Johanna. Not much is known of Johanna except that she fell in love with a lounge singer by the name of Robert Randall Mickey, and the two had a secret love affair when Johanna became pregnant. Eventually her father, a mobster and supposed devil worshipper as well, discovered the truth of the relationship and came after Robert with an awful vengeance. He had Robert murdered in cold blood, a point-blank shot to the head. Johanna became enraged at her father and poisoned him. She also took her own life and that of the five-month-old child inside her. There is even a love letter written on the wall of a makeshift office just above the stage. Um, it's, it's real tight to get up there, yeah. and it, I mean, it's just, um, you gotta walk across some old planks, and it's just, it's real hard to get up to. What's the same you don't mind saying? My, My love, love is, is as deep, deep as the sea. sea. Flows forever. You ask me where will it end, I tell you never. My love is bright as the sun that is hot as ever. You ask me when will it end, I tell you never. The world may disappear like a castle of sand, but I'll be waiting here with my heart in my hand. My love, I love you so much, now and forever. You ask me when will it end, I tell you never. My love is, I tell you never. Johanna's body was discovered in her dressing room, now in the basement. It is said that sometimes if you pass by the empty room, you can still smell the hint of a rose. The club shut its doors yet again. The 1970s brought on the spirit of rock and roll and country. The building was now the location of the Hard Rock Cafe. The Hard Rock was doomed from the beginning as bikers were always trashing it. People were even being shot outside the club. After only a few years of business, the cafe closed its doors in 1978. That spring is when the latest establishment reopened the doors, Bobby Mackey's Music World. Bobby, a well-known country music singer from the area, decided he wanted to turn this property into a home for great country music. Born March 25, 1948, brought up in Concord, Kentucky, growing up in his father's grocery store in Lewis County, little Bobby learned the songs of such classic country artists as Buck Owens and George Jones off the old jukebox in the store. After graduating high school, Bobby moved to Covington, Kentucky with his late wife Janet, to work on the railroad and pursue his singing career. Bobby enjoyed some national success with his music. Eventually, Bobby's career was stuck in a state of limbo while hitting all the small clubs. He wasn't climbing the charts as he would have liked in the late 70s. That's when he decided he needed to open his own bar where he and his band could play all their own music any night of the week and the fans would know exactly where to find him. At capacity, the 19th century building can hold around 520 of Bobby's biggest fans and supporters. Bobby's club had lines around the corner back in 1980, when his was one of the first bars to house a mechanical bull. 
Most every night of the week, you can listen to him crank out songs like Pepsi Man, Don't Worry About the Mule, and even classics by the likes of Hank Williams Sr. and Burl Haggard. It didn't take long for the empty building to come alive again once Bobby moved in. He fell in love with the structure the minute he laid his eyes on it. He felt as if he knew he was drawn to it. Could it be that Johanna's love was pulling in on some strange connection with the former lounge singer and its new owner? His real name is Robert Randall Mackey. You've got Johanna. Johanna's boyfriend was Robert Randall Mickey. Well, Johanna thinks that Bobby might be her reincarnated lover. I don't know. That, that would be very strange, I would think. Right. Uh, but who knows? I mean... Uh. I think it's possible that he could be keeping her here, her being attached to him for some of the similarities between Robert Randall and Bobby. So, uh, we had been doing some recording and had just finished up a uh, recording session in our studio and uh, uh, at the end of the session everybody was gone and, and there was a guitar on the guitar stand and uh, Danny reached and, grabbed, reached and grabbed the guitar by the neck and sat down on a piano bench and he says, what year did you say that was, all that happened? And I said, I don't know, sometime in the 1930s. So, Room there at Wyatt, the first line, way back in the 30s, in the little town of Wyatt. <laughs> Lived an old man and his lovely little daughter. And I just, you know, I just guided the story and, and he wrote the song in probably 20 minutes. Bobby, you know, singing the song and acknowledging the ghosts. Acknowledging a ghost isn't going to make it stick, stick around, I don't think. Uh, it can create an attachment maybe to the place, but uh, if there was a ghost here before him, then it's probably going to be here long after him. It's just not a good dance to him, and, uh, and when, that, when the heat of the night, when everybody wants to dance, I just refuse to do it. Uh, I, when I do that song, I used to do it at a, at a you know, a, 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 during the time when, it's, when everything's not really uptight and everybody wanting to dance. Being a singer with a wife who was currently pregnant certainly didn't help to ward off any kind of link. She claimed to have been attacked by a ladder down in the basement and even pushed down the steps of the upstairs apartment. And the very next day, she would have her child, five months premature. There's a mysterious irony in that all three women were five months pregnant. Investigators say it's not wise to take the tours while with child. I pregnant women get a lot of extra activity around them. When we bring them on tours, um, they tend to bring out things that don't happen usually. Um, there is an increased amount of activity around pregnant women, yes. Do you think a pregnant woman would be safe in here? Absolutely not. No, no I don't. That's, everything's our own opinion, but I wouldn't want to be in here pregnant. And I've I seen one come through on a ghost tour and I advised her not to do it. The pregnancies that have happened here, um, you know, tied to Pearl and Johanna and then Bobby Mackey's wife. Um, you know, they attach themselves to what, what they were like in life. Janet wasn't the only person in the bar experiencing strange phenomenon, however. The effects started creeping in on patrons and employees as well. Carl Lawson, the former caretaker, lived in the upstairs apartment. He claimed to have seen many random electronics turning on and off. He claimed he could hear the jukebox playing despite being unplugged. He felt the strongest presence from the basement. It was Carl who started digging up the ground, unearthing the well, and as some suggest, the demons right along with it. He then took it upon himself to sprinkle the well with holy water. This only seemed to intensify the behavior. Bobby himself was rather displeased to hear of the nonsense. It was bad for his business. Uh, this, the room that we're in is the room that he stayed in, and uh, he used to, uh, he used to uh, block the door so nothing could get in and slept with the shotgun. So. He wasn't afraid, but he was, <laughs> I guess he, uh, I guess he wanted to be, uh, 
you wanted to feel confident when you slept, he'd be all right, I guess. Well, I've, I've always noticed strange, strange things about Carl. Uh, you know, from the beginning, I mean, uh, like, I mean, he was a, he was just a kid. He was only 18 years old. He, he he lived in a house that the closest house to this place, just south of here, just out the Licking Pike, just south of this building, like a quarter of a mile. Which is where Carl was born and raised. He used to ride his bicycle up and down through here. He says that, that you know he'd, he'd ride by and he'd see a set of eyes up here in the window following him as he rode by on his bicycle. But Carl comes in the door one one evening and it's after dark. He comes in the door and, and, and he introduced himself. Hi, I'm I'm Carl. I just live up the street and I know all about this place. If you need to know anything, if you need any help, you know you know I'm, I'm available. So we hired him. First of all, Carl started trying to tell me these things, and I told him I didn't want to hear that. You know, that's absurd. I don't want to hear that. It's crazy. You know, I had more than I could handle putting everything I had into here and getting this place open, which was a chore in itself. So, uh, but but then he started, you know, telling Janet these things, and things started happening to her. And you know, I'm, you know, I've got all this going on. Uh, Got to get the place open first, and uh, and uh, you know all this stuff going on. I I, I told him not to say nothing about it. Uh, I don't want to hear it. Don't tell nobody. I don't want people knowing nothing about that. If anybody ever had more personalities than one, it'd be Carl. Uh, it, it all depends on if I mean if he's been heavily drinking, if he's been light drinking lightly. I mean, it just, it all depends with him. You know, I, I don't know if it's. And he's had a little alcohol problem from time to time, uh, but you know, who knows? Maybe that caused it. I don't know. Maybe that caused his problems. I don't know. But any time that I ever dealt with Carl, if he walked in right now, I would have to talk to him for a couple of minutes to decide who I was talking to. You know, uh, you know, he was always different. Carl was always different every time we talked to him. And, and, I, and in order for me to deal with him, if, if I needed something done, you know, or, or Carl, this needs done or that needs done, and you take care of this or that, I would have to talk to him for a moment to decide how I would deal with him. Hey. Carl's never given me advice on anything. I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah, we've talked about different things and um, different uh, apparitions we've seen. Carl eventually underwent an exorcism in the club's basement in 1991. How many of you are there in the room with us? Three. Three. No. See how it cuts in, and then it's right. the, that's the word, three, there's day. So go ahead and build on that, the three, the three are in the room with us. To this very day, there seems to be a presence looming over the bar. Paranormal investigators come from all over the country to see for themselves just what may be lurking inside Hell's Gate. No, no. Scientifically impossible. <laughs> Bobby Mackey doesn't necessarily believe in ghosts, but he'll never admit it. Well, he's such an in denial about it and not a firm believer of it, but I think most men are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They'll deny it to the bitter end that they see a ghost until it slaps them. At this point, the bar is more successful for having the legend around it. You can buy t-shirts in the gift shop, take the tours. You can even read about the murderous history throughout the walls of the building. When asked why Bobby refuses to move things around in the bar, he states that he likes the old feeling it I never wanted to change things. You know, I wanted to keep as much of the old Latin Quarter as possible. Like on both sides of the stage, you got those flamingo pictures. They were here when the first time I walked in here and there. We, we had them out there for a while and had something else in there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we put them back. There are articles, however, that point to the fact that he had spent $100,000 to renovate and add on to the existing building until a large 200-foot crack began to ruin the land. When they first came here, they started moving things around, um, remodeling a little bit, renovating. They were actually going to build a new club. And as soon as they started moving things around, an intense amount of activity happened. Of course, he won't admit to that it happened to himself, but um, to patrons and to employees they reported. He said that there was a lot of a, a kind of flare-up of activity. So he decided not to take any chances. The area just below Carl's old apartment is now a makeshift camera room. According to one of the caretakers, 
Bobby can sit there for hours at a time watching the video monitors. What interesting things could possibly be in all those countless hours of video that the public will never see? No one but Bobby Mackey will ever know the answer. Only you can make your own judgment on this bar. Who will you see roaming beside you? Will you be able to leave without mysterious scratches? Will you feel the cold chill and the heat? Whose random voice will you hear when you're all alone? Is there truly an overwhelming presence? Is it a way to continue to generate money into the pockets of a local business owner? Or is it a force not to be toyed with? Like most haunted places, if you come to visit looking for such things, you may leave disappointed. Then again, you may never want to come back because of what you have found. Or rather, what has found you. Can you do this for us? On something? Three times. Or two. That so was you in that room, was right? That you? It was not me. I heard it from back over there. I can't hear you. The reason there's so much presence here is because, you know, like... A shadow just went right across this wall right here. Really? I ain't BSing at all because I seen his shadow normal. His shadow was wow. right here. It came right across this way, right through here. Turn your light. Turn your light. Go ahead, keep talking. There you go. Turn your mic. Um, I don't remember. I said <laughs> <laughs> oh my God.